the countries of concern. This afternoon, or this at least this first session after lunch, is going to focus on the uh, multilateral dimension. Uh, I hardly need to remind this audience that this is clearly a, a very critical part of uh, the task of preventing and rebuilding failed states. Um, there are a lot of obvious questions that we have to address, but I think the key one that we're trying to get at here is how can the U.S. work with and better harness the various multilateral uh, organizations uh, focused on preventing and rebuilding uh, fragile failed states? And I think there are a couple of questions, sub-questions, if you will, that, that we want to try to get at is to what extent can these various organizations and the activities they do be be not only harnessed by the U.S., but, but organized in a way that's, that, that gives a more strategic approach to the, to the problem so that they can really take advantage of their respective uh, uh, comparative advantages uh, and um, so that they're all basically singing off the same uh, song sheet. So um, we're going to look at the opportunities for that, the, the impediments for that, and uh, we have two excellent speakers this afternoon. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through uh, lengthy uh, bios. They're all in the, the packet that you should have got. But we're going to start um, with Charles Cole, uh, who I believe has a PowerPoint presentation. No. Is that right? No? OK. He doesn't have a PowerPoint presentation. And Charles is uh, currently senior fellow at the US Institute of Peace. Uh, but uh, most of the time, he's an assistant professor at American University in the School of International Service. And he's going to look at constraints and opportunities in working with the UN system on fragile states. He will be followed by Chantal Jong Udrat, who is Associate Vice President at the US Institute of Peace. And she will be looking at the European dimension and more specifically European capabilities for coherence in fragile and failed states. So we will talk. I think each will have about uh, 15 minutes, and then we will open up for Q&A. So, Charles, you can either come here or... Thank you. Um, well, it's an honor to be invited here. And uh, <coughs> I'll also say that I, uh, you know, the speakers that I heard this morning, I unfortunately can't, had to come a little bit late, but uh, they were all very uh, smart people who were very easy to listen to because they're all very interesting. And so I hope not to break that chain. Um, I also hope to be brief, and I know that Chantal has laryngitis, and uh, her colleagues instructed me before I came over here uh, this morning to make sure she doesn't talk too much also. So uh, hopefully we'll have a lot of time for discussion. Um, it seems to me that um, uh, some of the logic for this, this gathering has to do with the constraints posed by uh, the global economic uh, crisis, if you will, for the work we do on, on fragile states, as well as the problem of fragile states. And I'm going to talk about the former. Um, it, is, it seems to be realistic to expect cuts in the available resources for international agencies working on these problems. Um, I, I would just say that don't forget that, and, and part of the logic of talking about multilateral actors in this panel <coughs> is that maybe we should take better advantage of multilateral actors and other actors. Um, I just want to remind everyone that don't forget these other actors are also going to be facing shortfalls as well because of this. And so um, I think that's an important consideration that I don't think the United Nations system in particular has begun to really grapple with wh how it's going to affect its work in the next two or three years in particular because these things have a lag, uh, a lag time, I think. Um, I also would point out that the United States government can shape the extent to which others pony up in, uh, through its own investments in these institutions. Um, but f uh, finally, aside from that, I think there's some very good reasons to think about cooperation and greater coherence and awareness of the advantages and disadvantages of working with and through other multilateral, uh, the United Nations system and uh, regional organizations. Most of my remarks are going to focus on the UN system. Um, and the UN system doesn't really use the term fragile or failed states. It doesn't, for the most part, use the term state building either. Um, there's an obvious reason for that, which is that the United Nations is comprised of member states, always capitalized. Um, so uh, member states are the entities that comprise the institution, and they are in some sense sacred in New York. And uh, to acknowledge that they are weak, failed, or, or failing immediately elicits a letter from the mission to whatever, whatever department or agency has hinted that your state might be weak 
uh, objecting vociferously and um, threatening to have the head of department fired for uh, insinuating such. Um, and and, and I, I really spell that out because it does happen. It has happened. And, um, and, um, and, 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 it's, and it, it is, in fact, one of the main reasons why this language is not used. Um, but they use other language, as I'm, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, I think that the United Nations system has a couple of advantages that are fairly obvious for this sort of work. One is the legitimacy that the UN system brings, the universal legitimacy that it brings um, for international action. The second thing is it is often the most obvious starting point for what are often called the three C's, uh, complementarity, coordination, and coherence. Um, it is an obvious starting point because it is seen as the place where people can go that is an honest broker, even though it often is not. Um, and let me say, uh, and I certainly think that this advantage is are true for mandated missions. And by mandated missions, I refer obviously to peacekeeping operations that are mandated by the Security Council, but al also to political missions, as they're called, or special missions, special political missions, which are often uh, authorized by other actors like the General Assembly and given to the um, to other departments like the Department of Political Affairs. Um, peace building support office is also involved in some of its own missions. And so uh, has the, in those situations where there is some sort of mission of, those, of the sorts I've just named, I think that there are some clear advantages to thinking about working with the, unit, through in the, unit, with the United Nations system. Let me start with the military side very briefly and then go to the civilian side, which I think is of more interest to this audience. Um, on the military side of military deployments, where there is counterinsurgency or a clear one-sided character of international troop deployment, the UN generally has not been as effective as bilateral actors. Um, I think that we've learned this the hard way. We learned this in UNPRA IV. Um, I think the international community has already essentially um, digested this lesson. So we see the Brits taking the lead in Sierra Leone, for example, um, in 2000. Um, however, um, that doesn't mean that bilaterals uh, you know, should not deploy as part of a multinational force with UN authorization. I think that's always preferable. I think the lessons of the last few years in the United States show that. Um, for the legitimacy of that deployment and the ease of the post-conflict job. However, where there's stabilization, where there is a stable is environment in these mandated missions, I think, that it makes a lot of sense to work with UN forces to the extent that they are, are there. UN or regional deployments are generally preferable. Um, and we have some, some studies that show there are also less, less expensive ways of going, certainly for the, the bilateral power that is deploying those forces. Um, one of the aspects that we see that's important on the military side is that uh, the great powers uh, essentially has seen through the Security Council behavior have in the last few years done two things that have changed the character of, um, of military deployments. One is that they have acknowledged that pulling troops out sooner on the sooner side, the example being, one example being Liberia in 1997 after Charles Taylor's election when uh, UN, the UN mission was completely shut down within three months of that election and uh, <coughs> um, ECOMOG forces were withdrawn within a year. Um, and led to, of course, war recurrence. Um, that's one example of where this sort of hasty withdrawal of forces that used to be championed by the United States for cost reasons, among other things, um, is, is not very uh, prudent. And so there's been a, an acknowledgment and a willingness to let peacekeeping forces stay longer. That's created new problems for how do you know when you, peacekeeping forces should come home in places like Sierra Leone, Liberia, Haiti, Timor, um, Bosnia and Kosovo. That's a separate talk. Um, and that's one of the changes that we've seen that I think is positive. A second change we've seen is that just basically uh, the default for deployment not being Chapter 6 anymore, but being Chapter 7. And so uh, you have these studies that look at sort of choices of Chapter 6 versus Chapter 7 mandates. And one of the important things to understand about that is there's a, essentially a policy shift that we're going to just deploy Chapter 7 from now on so that we always have the option of, of ramping up the use of force if necessary to protect our, our folks. Let me move to the civilian side. Um, Again, I'm talking about where there are mandated missions. I think there are some important um, advantages of legitimacy and serving as a logical point of convergence uh, that are manifest. Um, let me just give you an example. If I were hired by AID or a contractor of AID to work on justice reform in Haiti, a country where I've recently done some field work, and was sent off to Haiti next week to, to start work on justice reform, I think it would just be idiotic not to start as a frame of reference with the planning documents that the United Nations had begun develop had had, been, had spent the last few years developing in conjunction with the U.S. government, um, 
there have been basically efforts to, to, to develop coherent sectoral approaches in this area, and it would just be a, a tremendous waste of time and duplicative, and of course open up the donor community to being, to, uh, to being undermined but by w one donor by another um, in its interactions with the Haitian government. So um, what I would like to suggest is that I think that the starting point for, for donors, including the U.S. government, should be to participate in U.N. approaches has a default in countries where these mandated missions exist. And, um, and, the, and I think you should have to justify and say, okay, if we're not going to do it, there's some good reasons why not, right, rather than the reverse being the, the case. Um, and I think that's true in rule of law area. I think it's true in police reform efforts. I think it should be true in civil service areas and other areas as well. What sort of processes am I talking about? And I'm going to come back and talk about a lot of the deficiencies of the UN system. Just wait. Um, <laughs> But, but let me say, I'm talking here about joint needs assessments. I'm talking here about strategic planning processes, both interim frameworks that occur after conflicts, as well as um, often what are now PRSPs, Poverty Reduction Strategy Papers, which have become, in some sense, a planning document for medium and long-term development in post-conflict countries, even though they originally were long-term. Um, and the tracking of, and progress and implementation of these framing strategic framing or, or uh, documents as well. i also referring to the sector-specific planning processes that I uh, mentioned examples of earlier. Um, are there problems with the UN system? Absolutely. Um, and let me, let me talk about those, uh, close by talking about some of the, the, the constraints that the, U, the UN system poses as well as its opportunities. And really I'm just now going to focus a little bit on the, on the international side. Um, there are huge dysfunctions with the UN system. It's not very good at being strategic. I think the United States government has some of that problem as well, but the UN, the UN system has that, that problem in spades because of the way it's structured, because there's no center for strategic thinking about either for what we call, might call weak states or fragile states or about post-conflict states. The original concept, when I was working at the UN in 2004, when the, peace, the concept of the Peace Building Commission and the Peace Building Support Office were developed, was that that would become the body where a small number of people would be strategic and help to strategic planning and thinking about the UN approaches to these sorts of countries. Has it played out? It has not become that. It has not been that. We're now waiting for a new director of the Peace Building Support Office, but um, it has not been that in the interim. Secondly, there are well-known problems that I won't go into in terms of the recruitment of UN personnel and the systems of oversight and accountability, which are quite deficient. Um, I think you're all aware of those. Um, third, I think there, th there's th the most serious problem that I think is worth th talking about in this forum is this, the sort of problems of bridging the gap between a sort of military uh, uh, approaches of, the D of DPKO, short term, focused on stability and security, versus long term development approaches of the agencies, funds, and programs. And, and there's a huge gap there in terms of funding, in terms of capacity, in terms of thinking and planning in terms of thinking about that medium, that, that range of a few years that goes out from beyond a year or two out to four or five years. Right now what we see happening is DPKO is extending its scope of work and, and, and slowly extending its civilian capacities in those areas, but not adequately to do the sort of institution building that is going to ensure the success of the mission in terms of not ensuring war recurrence, amongst other things. Okay. Or, or state building, if you will, um, in terms of longer, uh, longer term objectives. On the development side, um, so let me finish with, the, with DPKO. I think we've seen, let me just hint at a number of improvements we've seen with DPKO in this field. The, first, the, the, expand, the creation of a rule of law office that works on security sector reform and rule of law in a more systematic fashion. Um, the enhancement of the UN civilian police office, the UNPOL component. And you have these specialists in DDR and gender and other things. Um, and I think conceptual development of thinking about the civilian side of what the DPKO does has really also become very uh, improved in the last few years. On the development side, UNDP is the most important actor, UN Development Program. And of course, most of you know that it has a bureau called the Bureau of Conflict Prevention and Recovery, BCPR, which was created several years ago, dedicated to these sorts of problems, as well as others, humanitarian disasters, amongst other things. BCPR has made a big difference in the way the UNDP and uh, in particular operates in these, in these environments. We also have sort of deputy SRSGs and missions that are devoted to providing some more coherence between the reconstruction element and the security elements, and they've developed some concepts and frameworks that are useful for this area. 
One of the concrete things we've seen here is basically more joint planning, certainly within the UN system, in terms of joint needs assessment. And those extend to including the World Bank and, and the IMF regularly now in immediate post-conflict post environment, rather than these institutions doing their own assessments. Now, that may seem like a baby step, but, you know, <laughs> it is, in fact, a baby step. But it's, uh, it is also something that was fought, hard fought over and, um, and, has been re and was resisted. Um, the creation of the Peace Building Support Office has improved attention to certain countries. I don't think it's had the kind of impact in terms of the thinking and operation of the UN system broadly for a number of reasons that I won't go into right now. Um, but it, I think it has improved the degree of attention and coherence to the UN's approaches and donor approaches in the, f in the f now four countries to where it has uh, essentially mandated to, to work. Those countries are admittedly not very big or strategic. That still is good for those countries, but not good for the broader work of the institution. Um, ha having acknowledged these, important, these, uh, these advantages, let me just uh, tick off a number of, of problems that, that still exist. The planning and the strategic planning is still insufficiently joint, it's insufficiently locally owned, and it's insufficiently prioritized. Um, let me give you an example from recent work I did last fall on, in Haiti when I was there doing a study of UN and state building, and the UN system and state building in Haiti. Um, one of the things we found is um, there was an interim cooperation framework that was hastily put together. It involved some modicum of a consultation um, with the government, but it was essentially a donor-driven process that put together some priorities in consultation with the transitional government. Now, don't forget in Haiti, again, I'm making the same caveat that was made earlier, uh, that I, I'm not going to give you the history of Haiti or the context of Haiti. I'm assuming some basic knowledge there. Um, but basically, in the immediate aftermath of Aristide's departure in 2004, there was a transitional government that wasn't considered to be very legitimate, internally or externally. And that partner still had to be consulted, but taken with a grain of salt. So a dicey arrangement and a, and a difficult thing to, ha to have happen. Subsequently, you had this uh, a poverty reduction strategy paper that was developed with more consultation um, and with meetings around the country, which is a positive, basically a step forward compared to other PRSPs that have under, been undertaken in post-conflict countries. Um, at the same time, <coughs> one of the thing, this, this document still has one of the main problems that these planning documents always have from the UN, which is essentially it's every, every agency gets its little piece thrown in without sufficient prioritization. So there's a prioritization on paper of three priorities, but in fact there's no prioritization of funding or funding mechanisms. And that continues to be a problem for, um, despite this, this progress, that continues to be a problem. Um, two other problems before I close. One is insufficient capacity on the civilian side, a problem the U.S. government also has, has acknowledged and other donors as well, bilaterals. Um, and certainly that's a problem of regional organizations as well, I would say. Um, and finally, um, on the development side, we have this inveterate reluctance to challenge um, states to shape up. And this is a, a real problem in states where elected governments um, act in ways that are exclusionary, and, and this is something that Bill Zartman was talking about earlier uh, today here. Um, the problem of getting post-conflict governments, whether they're elected or not, to, um, to act in a way that doesn't uh, exclude or alienate important sectors of the population. And one of the problems that the UN system has, particularly outside of mandated missions and certainly on the development side, is a deep reluctance to challenge governments um, because they are the client. It's essentially a consultant relationship to a client. It's essentially how the UN uh, presence often acts. And it's a serious problem of, um, of challenges. Um, it, it's a serious problem of keeping the government's feet to the fire in a peace process from a conflict resolution perspective. Um, in, in, and, and we've seen that that was a problem in Haiti, it was a problem in Liberia, and, um, and it's a problem that, that the UN system is continuing to grapple with. The last point I'll make is one of the, one of the is a suggestion that one of the, uh, that is coming out in the, the forthcoming report of the Secretary General on peace building in the aftermath, in the immediate aftermath of conflict, which is a call for more South-South technical cooperation for capacity building and technical assistance. Um, something that not only is, cost, is perhaps more cost effective, but also makes a good deal of sense from a legitimacy perspective in these environments. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Charles. Okay. Okay. Chantal. Thank you, Paul. Um, first of all, many thanks to uh, Michael Lunt and Howard Wolpe to have invited me here to come and speak on this panel. Um, this panel poses the question of uh, multilateral collaboration, uh, sometimes we also talk about multi-multilateralism. 
uh, that is cooperation amongst international organizations. Uh, and in my remarks, I would like to make a brief remark about multi-multilateralism, this international cooperation uh, amongst international organizations, and then I'll go to my assigned topic that is European capabilities uh, to deal with fragile and uh, failed states and whether there is any coherence in EU action. Um, on multi-multilateralism, um, Ever since, I think, the early 1990s, we've seen increasing calls for uh, greater cooperation between international organizations, uh, because if one state is not able to deal with all these global problems, neither is one international organization. Uh, and so the uh, demands for greater cooperation have been, uh, have been great. And I think there are powerful forces uh, to push international organizations to uh, cooperate, uh, limited resources, first of all, and then uh, second, the global and transnational character of the security challenges. Uh, but if we look at the track record of cooperation amongst international organizations, uh, this track record is actually quite negative. Uh, and I think there are four main obstacles to uh, achieving uh, such cooperation and to achieve coherence uh, at that level. Uh, first of all, there's an operational obstacle and it has to do with reconciling uh, different managerial cultures and capabilities of organizations. Second, it has uh, political obstacles. It has to do with reconciling different mandates and political ideologies of these organizations. Third, there are structural obstacles which have to do with the difficulty of multilateral cooperation in general and multilateral cooperation in the security field in particular. Uh, issues of power and trust and asymmetrical relations are very hard to deal with. Um, you know, states have very little confidence that their cooperation will pay off in the long run. And lastly, I would say there are some conceptual obstacles and those have to do with how we define multilateralism or what we think drives multilateralism. And I think here there are two schools of thought. Um, there's one school of thought who sees multilateral cooperation as driven by efficiency and effectiveness uh, as a means to reduce transaction costs. And what we could call this instrumental or effective multilateralism, it's problem-oriented multilateralism. The other school of thought sees multilateralism as a mode of cooperation that should allow for greater representation, accountability, and justice. It's what one could call representative multilateralism or actor-oriented multilateralism. And I think today the challenge of many international organizations is to reconcile these two notions of multilateralism. I think we see this when we look at the debates in the UN uh, on the reform of the UN Security Council. We see this also in debates on humanitarian intervention. Um, <coughs> my, my bottom line here is that uh, cooperation between and amongst international organizations is very hard to achieve. Uh, it requires agreements and trust at multiple levels among a wide variety of actors. And I think it is, uh, we would do well to keep our expectations realistic. Uh, you know, international organizations or regional organizations for that matter are no panacea. Uh, sometimes we have had the tendency uh, because of the failure of the UN to deal with uh, issues to uh, want to leap to regional organizations, but those organizations have a lot of problems. Um, as to European capabilities, um, I think if you look at the EU, uh, the EU really has made enormous progress over the past 15 years. Its membership has more than doubled uh, to 27 members now. It has a combined population of almost 500 million. Um, the EU is a world leader in, uh, in terms of development uh, aid. Uh, it provides roughly 60% of aid financing to the developing world. Uh, the EU is also an extremely important contributor to UN programs and activities. Uh, EU member states provide 37% of the UN budget and 40% of the UN peacekeeping budget. Um, 
In addition, since the, 1990, 90, since the 1990s, the EU has steadily developed its common foreign and security policy and its capacity to intervene in locations outside of Europe through the European Security and Defense Policy, what we used to call ESDP. Um, in 2003, Europe also adopted a European security strategy that outlines a vision of Europe uh, of global security challenges and the role of Europe as a global actor uh, to deal with these uh, challenges. And one could say that was a first step uh, towards greater coherence in foreign policy for the EU. Uh, the EU has also started to streamline its institutions and decision-making procedures. Uh, in part, this was uh, driven by its continuing enlargement um, and these uh, efforts have led to the Lisbon Treaty that despite a lot of setbacks, uh, we think might come into, uh, into force at some point later this year or early next year. Uh, when it does, uh, it will also increase the institutional coherence of the Union, in particular through the creation of the EU High Representative, uh, that's basically the Foreign Minister of the EU, uh, the establishment of European Foreign Service, uh, the European External Action Service, uh, and this will lead to greater coordination between uh, the Commission on the one hand and the Council on the other, or if you want, between the supranational efforts of the EU on the one hand and the uh, intergovernmental efforts on the other. It will also uh, provide possibilities for small number, uh, small groups of states to uh, work more closely together on particular issues and in particular on defense issues. So I think if you look at the EU, uh, it is trying to establish greater institutional coherence. It does so also by the establishment, and, and this is a, um, uh, a, a, a target of a better integrated civilian and min military planning structure uh, for ESDP operations. It has early warning units, uh, and it has different other instruments uh, to deal uh, with these type of issues like the European Development Fund, uh, the EU Special Representatives, uh, the European Defense Agency for that matter. Currently, the EU is engaged in 12 missions in Europe, the Middle East, Afghanistan, and Africa. It's a total of about 5,000 people who are deployed. Uh, most of these missions are civilian missions, uh, that means um, police missions or rule of law missions, uh, and granted they're relatively small in nature, but the EU has also recently uh, fielded two major military missions, one in Bosnia with uh, 2,500 troops, and a mission that just finished and was handed over to the UN in Chad that involved 3,700 troops. In addition, um, the EU has established battle groups. Those are groups of um, 1,500 combat groups with about 1,000 support personnel. There are about 15 battle groups now operational. Uh, it has a police force, or it can stand up a police force of up to 5,000 police uh, officers. It has uh, over 600 rule of law experts on the roster. Uh, it has uh, several hundred civilian administrators, civil protection experts, etc. Uh, the EU has also set up a uh, European Gendarmerie Force, which is a 3,000, uh, which counts 3,000 uh, gendarmeries. Uh, <clears throat> In late uh, December 2008, uh, the Council has uh, set itself as a target that the EU should have the capability of two major stabilization and reconstruction uh, operations supported by up to 10,000 troops uh, for at least two years, and in addition have a dozen other ESDP civilian missions, that is these rule of law missions or these police missions. Uh, there are also ideas, and they have been particularly pressed in the European Parliament, of setting up a civilian peace corps um, and this would be a civilian peace corps of around uh, 2,000, 3,000 civilian experts that would be able to be sent out to uh, situations where needed. Um, in addition to this, uh, the EU have approximately 9,000 personnel uh, devoted to UN missions and around 40,000 uh, troops to NATO operations. So on paper, 
Uh, this looks all pretty good. Um, all the elements of a coherent policy are also laid out. At the conceptual level, the European security strategy and its updated implementation document of December 2008 uh, establishes the importance of the connections between security, development, poverty eradication, good governance, human rights, a real whole of system and comprehensive approach. Uh, it also uh, stresses the importance of, the import of uh, cooperating with the UN and other international organizations. So this looks all very good on paper. Uh, yet I think there are really problems with the uh, EU policies in this field. Uh, first is operational. I think one can rightly argue that the EU is functioning way beyond its capacity. Uh, it has over two million uh, people, personnel in uniform, uh, but the Union is only able to deploy about 100,000 troops. Um, the 60,000 rapid reaction force, some of you might remember in the early, in the late 90s, uh, that the EU was supposed to set up uh, has remained a paper tiger and the battle groups are sort of being used to, to, to push over that or to, to paper over that issue. Uh, defense spending is very low. Only five EU members uh, spend more than 2%, which is the NATO uh, target on defense. And I think the financial crisis uh, will not help this situation. On the contrary, I think the financial crisis uh, will lead to more cuts in defense budgets, and the immediate um, and obvious cuts will be in multilateral operations. Um, lastly, and this is a problem that the EU shares with all international organizations, these organizations have no capacities of their own. These capacities remain in the hands of member states, and so these organizations can make decisions to deploy troops, uh, but when push comes to shove, our um, EU member states will still have to make these troops available, and so oftentimes uh, we see these pledges uh, evaporate when the call comes in to actually deliver troops. Uh, the second problem is institutional, and that is in some policy areas, uh, in particular in the foreign policy and defense area, um, are in the intra-governmental structure, uh, that is the Council, and some uh, of the policies, in particular humanitarian and economic and development issues, are in the supranational structure, and this inevitably leads to uh, incoherence. Uh, now, the EU prides itself that it is the embodiment of the comprehensive approach that can put together civilian and military instruments at the same time, uh, yet in the institutional architecture, uh, we're not quite there yet. The third problem is political, and that is um, despite the creation of all these new instruments, uh, the union is very divided. Um, there is a division between old and new members. Uh, there is no agreement on policy priorities. Uh, public opinion is very removed from these debates, and if you look at the European Parliament elections, uh, with dismal um, participation of the public uh, and uh, a rise of eurosceptics. And in my own country, the Netherlands, uh, the, uh, the election results just pain me. I don't know what to do. Um, so uh, the EU is, is, is really not a unitary actor. Now, very briefly, um, if we look at the other main security institutions in, uh, in Europe, NATO and the EU, the situation isn't much better. Uh, all of these institutions have developed crisis management capabilities in the 1990s, uh, but they are all struggling to articulate a coherent uh, organizational vision of their future. Um, you know, the OSCE in the beginning was very well placed, in particular with its sort of comprehensive of uh, concept of security linking political, military, and economic issues. Uh, one would say the OSCE was very well placed. However, um, with the German uh, issue being resolved, the Russians started losing interest in the OSCE. 
um, with successive uh, enlargement of both NATO and the EU, OSCE also lost this advantage of its inclusive membership. Um, and uh, increasingly, the OSCE and the EU have been, particularly as the EU was trying to build up its credentials in the security field, um, the OSCE has increasingly come in competition uh, with the EU, and we see this in the Caucasus and in, in the Balkans. Um, there's also political dissent in the o within the OSCE. Uh, Russia and some of the other CSIS states are not so keen on the assistance on democracy and global and good governance. Uh, and lastly, the uh, resources of the OSCE are very small. Um, now, there has been a, a little bit of a resurgence around the OSCE with the proposal by the Russians to uh, think about a new European security architecture, and we're talking now about an OSCE plus. Um, and, uh, you know, that might hold, hold some hope for the uh, OSCE in the future. Uh, finally, NATO, it's a mighty military alliance, but it has, is undergoing its own identity crisis. I don't need to talk about Afghanistan, we all know how much problems the Secretary General has in generating additional forces. Um, and uh, the political division within uh, NATO about what should NATO be, uh, a division between maximalist and minimalist, um, is, um, is going on in, 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 full, uh, in full fledged. So, I think uh, that's the picture. Uh, it's modest efforts. Um, Yet, these European institutions are the best you can get. Uh, these are the best endowed institutions uh, that you will find uh, with most resources. Uh, so that should uh, also uh, give us some pause when we think about other regional organizations. So it's that, let me stop there. Okay, thank you, Chantal. Um, we have just over 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, I'm going to use my position here to ask the first question to, to both speakers to give you some time to uh, uh, collect your thoughts on, on some specific questions. Um, both of you gave very succinct overviews of both the assets and also the kind of limitations of your respective the multilateral groupings. What I didn't hear so much on was the institutional linkages between the US and those multilateral institutions and how, you know, is, are the current arrangements basically okay and as good as we're gonna get or are there ways in which those linkages and the way in which the US can basically, uh, to use the term I used at the outset, harness, drive, shape, whatever verb you want to use, those various groupings, are those current arrangements adequate? Can they be improved? And if so, how, how so? Either one I, first. I can maybe start off on, um, I think there's some positive developments here. Uh, for a long time, the US was very ambiguous uh, with regard to EU defense capabilities. Uh, and I think there has been a real shift. And even uh, under the previous administration, uh, of accepting and recognizing that uh, it's in the U.S. interest to have greater capabilities at the EU level. So I think there is a, um, uh, there is some positive development that said we don't have the institutional structures right now to, to channel that into a, uh, into a constructive relationship. Uh, right now, the EU and NATO, um, that relationship is just terrible. Uh, it is awful, and um, we have to find a way to uh, to get around this this flawed relationship between EU and and NATO, uh, because that is ultimately, I think, having the U.S. and the EU work together on these issues, uh, given the resources that the EU can bring to bear, even if they are modest. Um, need to be in play, but I, I think we need some new structures for particular EU-US cooperation. Um, I have some partial answers to that. Um, 
you know, I think that one of the, you know, I left out the whole sort of atmosphere of the relationship between the U.S. and the U.N. spoiled horribly in 2003 over the Iraq War, and then um, deepened in some ways in around 2006 and 2007, where there's an attitude amongst some of the emerging powers to basically s encourage smaller states to, s to start going in alone and bucking the West, particularly in the development assistance area, um, moves to sort of control boards of the agencies and funds in ways that would basically further and distance uh, the, in the organization from U.S. influence, if you will. And um, obviously the election of President Obama has, has sort of changed the, 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 the landscape. It's not clear how much or how it's changed the landscape. Um, you know, Susan Rice's appointment, I think, was viewed very positively in, in, inside the Secretariat and by other member states. Um, she hired some very good people. You know, I talked to some people at the Secretariat two or three months ago, and they were like, oh, my God. It's like the next thing I know, some Sri Lankan who sits next to me is going to be hired by the U.S. mission. What's going on over there? Um, and so it, it was, uh, it, I mean, it really made people think they're hiring some very good people who know the system and, and who... Um, who are going to think carefully about that, and I know that they already are doing that. In fact, um, you know that there's the most, you know, the biggest change that's, that's most visible is the is the Human Rights Council um, sort of changing the position on that, um, and I think that's just em emblematic of what I would say, which is that we, what we see now is a reengagement, and that reengagement is basically saying, okay, we're going to play ball with you, and now, and we have yet to see how far and how deep that's going to go. Um, you know, I think we shouldn't expect huge transformations. I think there are going to be some knee-jerk reactions that are skeptical. Um, the review of the Peace Building Commission is coming up. The U.S. is a member. I think they're looking at investing more in that institution and, and, that, um, and the work of it. Um, and I think they're really in a position, I think the U.S. is also in a position to really do some of the reforms to peacekeeping and to development agencies in the way that um, I've described to really get them to sort of move away their, from their entrenched ways of doing things. And I'm optimistic about that. Um, at the same time, you know, there's some things in Washington, things in Washington don't change very much. And I would, uh, I, you know, my pitch here has basically been saying it's, it's time to reassess that and to really think about greater engagement with the UN. One of those is the way the AID deals with the UN system, sort of a very arm's distance. And my, you know, one of the things that I observe is just a willingness to engage in these planning processes so you can influence them more than you do by not, not participating. And the last thing I'll say on this front is the formation of the new um, Civilian Response Corps, which may be up to 4,000 people as it's projected, not funded yet. But that group, that the deployment of those people in what will undoubtedly in most of the cases be in places that have multilateral components and presences you know, orienting that to work in, in tandem with the civilians deployed by other actors, um, I think needs to receive careful attention. Thanks. Okay. Any takers? Yes, front row. Please wait for your microphone if you could uh, say who you are. And Ken Minkhouse, Davidson College. Um, a question uh, for Chuck about uh, two problems in multilateral coordination in fragile states, one old and one new. The old one is information and analysis, um, or if you want to use the dirtier word, intelligence. Um, we know the UN isn't structured uh, to create its own uh, analysis. Uh, it's also very sensitive politically uh, in, in fragile states for, the, for UN agencies to be developing papers that are suggesting that these states are in trouble. What we've seen over recent years is UN specialized agencies all developing, kind of outsourcing uh, the, the, this this task and then giving themselves a little disclaimer on it. Um, do you see, uh, to me, working in these fragile states and failed states uh, requires excellent uh, information and analysis or we're going to get the policies wrong. Do you see any trends in the UN toward improving both the quality of their analysis and their ability to share it given the constraints that they're under? And then a new problem, uh, security. Um, if Do you have any comments on the rise of the UN Department of Safety and Security uh, and its remarkable role over th that's evolved over the past 15 years, essentially having veto power over all the other UN specialized agencies based on their security assessment of where you can and can't go? There's, there's a lot there, so whatever you want to take. <laughs> yeah, may maybe uh, one more. Yeah, at the back. Tony? Tony Gambino, another UN question. Uh, I appreciated your candor, Charles, and in a context of an organization where member states always has to be capitalized, and you talked about delicately the reluctance to challenge states. 
I wonder if you talk a little bit more about UNDP particularly as it relates to fragile states. Uh, many people, including myself, who've had experience with UNDP and fragile states uh, think that their performance has been uh, beyond unacceptable. It's just been really bad for reasons that you talk to. So my question is, is it fixable? If so, how? And if it's not fixable, should we use some, think about some kind of new structure within the UN system that relates specifically to fragile states, either breaking out BCPR as some kind of new function, or more deeply empowering the ad hoc missions like a Monuk mission in the Congo so that it can actually undertake these functions? Okay. Excellent questions. Um, very briefly, Ken, on yours. Um, on the security thing, I just don't know enough to a answer that, but to agree broadly with your assessment that, you know, it's the, the uh, Iraq in particular really reshaped the, the landscape of def deference on security to, 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 uh, to, that, to that unit. Um, on information analysis, you know, I don't think, you know, I think your concern is, y the, you, you laid out the problems adequately, I won't repeat that, but your question was, is there any hope of increased access in the UN sharing its inf in information or intelligence, if you will, more broadly? I think that that's not really what the question that I would have asked. I would have said, is there any hope that the UN can gain access to better intelligence from bilateral intelligence agencies, if you will, in a way that um, can enable them to work, can it enable it to work better with regional <coughs> organizations and, and bilaterals? And I, I hope that that, I, I do think that that I, I see that happening incrementally. It depends on the context in particular and the relationship and the strategic interests, frankly, of, of the U.S. and other actors who are involved. Um, I don't see um, any qualitative improvement in, act, in, in information analysis at the U.N., in, in, any sort of step up in any qualitative way, you know, incremental at best, but, but not really. I think there's more attention to the problem, and I think what I would like particularly to see is more systematic mechanisms of outsourcing, of using these third parties, if you will, to basically, to develop in systematic ways to use these NGOs to basically host events where they can get the intel and then pass it along to UN agencies and have sort of a, a broker there to provide a buffer so the UN isn't, it doesn't c get the political heat. I think those mechanisms uh, need to be beefed up, and that means funding some of these organizations that can serve that purpose. Um, Wow, you know, you put me on the spot. I just, uh, I was really hopeful. Um, I, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be frank here for give me three minutes. I was really optimistic about the work of BCPR within UNDP, um, based on some of my experiences um, in New York and, and visiting West Africa a few years ago, three years ago. And then um, I was in Haiti in the fall, and and I came back supremely depressed about the ability of UNDP. I, I really question whether it is even possible to save UNDP on this front, and I and I. Um, you know, the only hope I have is that I was able to articulate some of this to the, the new uh, gentleman who's been to Jordan Ryan, who's the new head of BCPR within UNDP, uh, a couple of weeks ago, who has a vision of what BCPR should be that's fantastic and um, has done some of that very work that we all hope that UNDP would do in the Liberian context where he was the deputy SRSG. And I think that the problem with uh, some of the folks who've seen that work is they think that's the norm, and the problem with some of the people like me who've been to Haiti is we think that's the norm. Um, I mean, the problems there are we have people in the development world who basically didn't want, they don't <coughs> want to meet, they don't want to talk with anybody from the peacekeeping side of the house, they don't want to talk about um, conflict resolution and security, they just want to do development, and they say things like somebody from Canadian CETA, you know, told a UN official, which is, you know, I've been here 40 years, and we've been here 40 years, and I've been working on this stuff for, in, in Haiti for 40 years. And she said that like that's a good thing, right? I mean, that's the embarrassing thing, right? And we're gonna be here after you, and you'll see, right? We'll win, as if that's victory. Um, and so that's sort of the real problem of attitude that you and a, a lot of people at UNDP have. And I think that you know, the only hope that they do have is to basically change the way they recruit, train, and incentivize staff to deal with conflict issues in a much more integrated way in the work that they do. Um, uh, otherwise, then I think, I, you know, the problem with doing, you know, there's, you know, I've looked at creating some kind of post-conflict recovery mechanism, or like breaking off BCPR, I've talked to some people about that. You know, you might have some of the same problems, and the problem is you want to harness the resources that come through the development agencies, and that's the problem with doing that, right? Um, 
And the problem with beefing up, and I think DPKO has already done a little beefing up and becoming sort of peacekeeping plus, moving into peace building. I mean, they're doing peace building, even though they can't use that term because that's some other agency's, you know, uh, purview, obviously. So they don't use that term in DPKO, but that's what they're doing, and they know that. Um, and they have beefed up their, their, their capacities, but the problem is that they, they need to build, beef those up in a very systematic way, but they're, they're still stripped of resources. And unless they can ever get access to the resources, then that gap is always going to be there. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. Yes, sir. Wait, wait for the uh, mic, please. Uh, I'm uh, Mark from the Army, and I have a question. Do you think that Europeans' growing Muslim population will have a uh, profound effect on uh, peacekeeping operation, European peacekeeping operations and security policy, and if so, how? Well, it has a profound effect on uh, domestic politics, and I think, uh, yeah, it will certainly have an effect on, you know, how it looks at the Middle East, etc., on peacekeeping operations, I don't really see that so much. I think where Europe really sees its sort of task or where its priority would lie would be in Africa. Um, and I don't see how that, you know, having greater Muslim population, how that would change that equation. Mm -hmm. I know in uh, Russian recruitment into their army, I think by 2030, more than 50% of the recruits will be Muslim coming into the Russian army. Another question. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Katie Collin and I'm a student at AU. Uh, and I was hoping that Chantal could comment on um, the regional body's civilian uh, components, civilian activities. Um, I know in, in the field that I'm specialized in, which is elections, that they're very, the EU and OSCE are, have a, a strong niche, and I was hoping you could comment on maybe some other areas where they're active. Yeah, I would say, uh, I mean, that is one of the, the issues that divides a lot of European states, is whether we should put emphasis on the military instruments or on the civilian instruments. and. Uh, grosso modo, the, the Nordic countries have been pushing the civilian instruments uh, rule of law, missions, police, election monitoring, etc. Um, but here you see also the, the, the sort of pernicious effects because actually what is happening is that uh, the OSCE had developed uh, extreme um, fine capabilities in, in this domain uh, but is gradually being crowded out by the EU because the EU feels that it needs to um, have credible missions, and it, and, and, and it can crowd out the OSCE very easily uh, because it has greater resources. Uh, but this poses a question for the OSCE, you know, what should its future be? And uh, in 2005, there was this panel of eminent men that was put together to think about the future of, of the OSCE, and they, they pointed to uh, the importance of these election monitoring missions, et cetera, the mediation effort where the OSCE has been, um, has been very effective, I would say. Uh, but these proposals haven't led to anything right now because ultimately uh, all these problems of these organizations being the EU, NATO, or the OSCE, uh, it's a political problem. Uh, and it's about the distribution of power, where power lies, um, and there have been proposals that maybe the OSCE should develop into a real niche, maybe global niche organization that would focus just on election monitoring and could then have a greater relationship also with the EU, UN and other regional organizations. But for now, all these things are a little on hold, uh, in part because the organization as such, its rationale is unclear to its member states. Okay, I think that's about it. We're, we're out of time. Um, I want to thank the prominent man and the prominent woman for their, their <laughs> comments. Uh, and please join me in thanking.